Are you ready to do good, feel good, and buy pie? Slice of Life, Food and Friends' annual Thanksgiving pie sale is back. It's the sweetest way and the easiest way to give back this holiday season. Every pie purchased provides one full day of free, medically tailored meals to a neighbor living with serious illnesses like HIV, AIDS, or cancer. Order your pie by November 19th at sliceoflifedc.org. That's sliceoflifedc.org. Today on CityCast DC, are DC's monuments fun or just more effort than they're worth? Is La Dip a must-visit restaurant experience or just overpriced? If there's one thing we like to do here, it's debate what aspects of D.C. are over or underrated. My CityCast D.C. co-host Mike Schaefer and I sat down to continue the tradition of asking, what exactly is over or underrated about living in the DMV? Today's Tuesday, November 12th. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what D.C. is talking about. Okay, so Mike, as you know, we have been talking a lot on the show about underrated aspects of D.C. We did underrated restaurants, underrated museums. Underrated city cast hosts. Yes, both of us. <laughs> and I think it kind of made me realize, like, in the conversations, someone would say, like, oh, this is so underrated. And I'd be like, oh, I think that's overrated. I feel like one person's underrated is another person's overrated. Yes, exactly. And although we at CityCast exist to help you all find cool stuff Sometimes it's kind of fun to slam not-so-cool stuff. It's true. In our Underrated Gems episode, I had to throw in a, a museum, or I guess I'll say like a DC experience that I found very, very overrated. So it's not all peaches and cream and sunshine and light over here. Sometimes we think things are very overrated. But at any rate, you found a bunch of fierce arguments around town between people who think certain things are uh, overrated or underrated or maybe just right. That is correct. So let's start with the obvious. Can you guess where I'm going with this? I think you're going to the National Mall. That's right. The monuments, the mall, all of it. Some people say it's like accurately rated, like it's fine. Some people say that it's completely overrated, which I kind of get. You know, they're crowded, they're hot, there's no shade. It's always way more walking than you think it's going to be, at least if you're me. Yes, and it's at least if you're like seven years old, too which uh, a lot of the visitors seem to be. They're being sort of dragged along behind their parents. Um, the ice cream's kind of expensive, so the parents are annoyed about that. Yeah, I have a very clear memory of being a little kid and going to the monument tour and crying, whining in front of all my classmates because I was so hot and tired. <laughs> yeah, not a lot of trees. I mean, I think they designed that thing, you know, 120 years ago or whatever it was. Uh it's a great, amazing stage for like a mass gathering of human beings. But the actual experience of like walking along that strip of uh, green from place to place, you know, the vista is awesome, but it, it can get awfully hot in the summer. And it'd be nice to be walking down a city street at that moment. So what's the verdict here? That area of D.C., overrated, underrated, accurately rated. What do you think? So I don't know that it's overrated because I just don't know that it's actually rated that highly. I mean, people will say like, hey, the free Smithsonian museums are amazing, which is mostly true. But there's not that many people who talk about the experience of like strolling across the unshaded green from place to place. <laughs> Cook it in the hot, hot sun. So maybe maybe that area is adequately rated. Nobody's talking about it. Like They talk about, you know, the interesting, iconic spots of other cities. but like. Maybe it's nice to check out. So maybe maybe the rating there is accurate. We're accurately talking about it. But look, people go down to the National Mall as tourists or when they want to explore their own city or when they've got family in town to go to specific places. I think a lot of the Smithsonian museums ringing the mall are really, really good. Mm -hmm. And even the ones that aren't that popular, you know, like the African Art Museum, which is way underground and stuff. You can go down there if you're if you're at work and you want to take a, a long lunch. You can kind of feel quite alone. It's quite cool in a lot of these spaces. I mean, physically, it is it is not hot, <laughs> and that's just a really cool thing about being in downtown Washington. Okay, 
So it sounds like maybe individual spots are perhaps underrated, but as a whole, maybe we're talking about it the way that we should accurately rate it. Right. I think there's an instinct as like people who actually live here to say like, ah, that's just for tourists. But actually, that's like we have access to some pretty cool stuff down there. I mean, I, there's so much to complain about living in a city like D.C., but it is nice to find those things that are like, oh, it actually is nice. Yes, exactly. So let's talk about restaurants, because this was probably one of the other biggest sources of debate about whether it was they were overrated or underrated or accurately rated DC's most iconic restaurants. And so the ones that came up the most when I was doing my very scientific research were La Dip, Old Ebbett Grill and Ben's Chili Bowl as either, oh, totally overrated, totally underrated or totally accurately rated. What are your thoughts on these iconic DC restaurants? Uh, well, some easy two things. One, like I think in a sense, any hot restaurant is overrated because right now food culture is such that people are willing to put up with all manner of like ignominy in order to eat at or get a table at whatever is deemed hot. And, you know, considering that like going out, particularly to an expensive meal is supposed to be like a nice experience. The idea that you're like knifing your neighbor in order to get a reservation or standing on a long line or what that kind of defeats the purpose which is that like you're willing to you're about to drop a bunch of money and and you want an experience that treats you like a king i think of those three you mentioned i think the dip's really good i think like falderall or about it is a function of like it's kind of weird and a function of like that there's just not that much supply of that sort of place in the district but i think it's really good old Ebbett grill is not really good but I think everyone kind of knows that because it's an iconic place and it's sort of somehow tied to like old Washington national politics, it gets some, some people in, which is great. But it's, it's more like, like a revolving restaurant or something, <laughs> like a place with an amazing view. They don't have to actually kill it on the food. Oh, my um, God. I'm such a cornball. I love a revolving restaurant. That gets me every time. A restaurant right? with a view that doesn't have great food, but it's like you're not actually paying for the food. You're paying for the view and the experience. I'm the sucker who falls for that. If you're ever wondering who is paying money for this, it's me. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for, you know, there's some people who want to go to, you know, I'm going to a place where like Andrew Jackson went. Or I don't actually know if he went there, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then the third place you mentioned, I mean, this is hard. Ben's Chili Bowl, right? Look, it, it's, you know, it, it is a hallowed DC icon. It is, you know, a, a vestige of a black Washington culture that has in a lot of places been muscled out of like the commercial storefronts. It, it's also open at like really long, awesome hours. <laughs> but uh, people do, do sometimes forget as they prepare to visit this iconic place that like at the end of the day, it's like a hot dog and chili joint. Right. And like there is a range of how good hot dogs and chili can be. And I'm willing to believe they are at the very top end of that range. But it's still a hot dog and chili joint. Like, let's yes. not get too carried away, you know? I feel exactly the same way. When, when people are like, oh, I, was, I went there and everyone was talking about how I had to go there and I went there and it was just like hot dogs and chili. It's like, well, yeah, like the reason why it is such a hollowed, iconic, important part of D.C.'s history, I would argue is like, Maybe not even because of the hot dogs and chili. Like, I think it's something else. And so it is yeah. one of those places that so I they say, stayed like, open. Yes. Like, and so when I'm there, I'm really appreciating that history. And I, I do think it's something that if you were, if someone was coming to D.C. for the first time, I would say like, oh, well, you got to go there because it's it's part of what I love about the history of D.C. is like honoring and preserving that history. So, right. um, yeah. The other thing is about like late night spots that are popular is kind of part of the reason to go to a late night spot, you've been out late with your friends, you've been drinking, whatever, is you kind of want to just go sit down and not have a long, not have a big schlep. And on nights when it is popular, you're kind of going to have a schlep. You're going to stand in line. You're going to be kind of looking around nervously to see if you can find, <laughs> snag a seat before someone else, like all that stuff. And that is a great sign for them. It means their business is going really well, but it actually sometimes defeats like the goal of going to get a hot dog at three in the morning, which often has less to do with the excellence of the hot dog or even the excellence of the history than it does with like, I just want to go sit down with my friends and I'm kind of tired. Yes. Oh, that reminds me of another potential overrated, underrated thing. Food trucks. In the rare occasions where I'm after a night out with friends and I just want to get a, a food item and sit, I often find myself at a food truck and it's like, oh, cool. I'm standing in line for like 20 minutes 
to get my thing that I then have to sit on a curb and eat on my lap. Like, I feel like it's one of those things that once I actually get it, maybe it's not as good as it felt in my head. Yeah, I think there was a moment when like food trucks, there was a a feeling of authenticity about them because, Mm -hmm. you know, if you want to start like... Bridget's weird food and like what like whatever strange uh, item you want to serve, but it's authentic to you and your creative vision. You can just get a food truck and go. I mean, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but you don't have to like pony up your life savings for like a lease on a storefront and et cetera. And that meant that there was like a sort of authenticness and creativity about it. But it, it also meant that like a lot of places that are just slinging the kind of regular food got treated for a little while as like a really special, sexy, disruptive kind of thing with that that was probably undeserved. Yeah. Now you're paying $32 for a grilled cheese. <laughs> right. Let's be real. Lawsuits are not fun. But with Christopher Nace and the trial lawyers at Paulson and Nace, At least they're a little easier. Paulson & Nace is a D.C. law firm in every sense of the word. It was founded here in 1979. Partner Chris Nace is a local who cares deeply about the D.C. community, even serving on the board of the local branch of the Living Classrooms Foundation in his free time. Nace and his associates, Samantha Peters, John Reese, and Maya Perry, handle medical malpractice, wrongful death, and other complex injury cases. And they don't just settle every case. They'll go to court. They'll fight for you. Paulson & Nace has even been recognized as one of best lawyers' best law firms. So if you have been hurt or lost a loved one because of someone else's mistake or negligence, call Paulson & Nace for a no-obligation consultation. Visit www.paulsonandnace.com or call 202-463-1999. Having car problems? Well, with Rhoda, getting them fixed is as easy as ordering takeout. They'll come pick up your car for free, do any repair or maintenance needed, and return it right to your driveway. They'll even give you a complimentary video inspection of your car so you can see what needs to be done. Perfect for those of us that maybe aren't so car savvy. Book your appointment online at roda.com. And lucky for you, CityCast listeners get a 20% discount on any service for up to $100 off. Just use the code CityCast20. Well, speaking of like standing in lines and wondering like, oh, is this really that fun? Let's talk about street fairs, because this is something that I have deep down kind of always felt that I thought was a little bit overrated. And then Reddit user Alan Smith 2343 gave an unpopular opinion that D.C. cultural and street festivals are overrated, overcrowded and generally not worth attending. And when I read that, I was like, oh, my God, this person has finally articulated what I have always felt deep down. Alan, you're singing my song. I'm, I'm with you guys. <laughs> it's part of it is DC because of you know its history and stuff. It doesn't really have like long-standing ethnic neighborhoods where like there is something sort of organic and authentic about the street fair. They tend to be imported to wherever they are. There's nothing nothing wrong with this per se, but it does lend a sameness to it. So if you're going to the Caribbean Fest on Georgia Avenue. It might be awesome. It might be not. It might not be whatever you think of it. It's not like it is springing from like a vast West Indian population right. who have lived for a generation or three along those blocks. There are obviously some. This is the capital of the country. There's people from all over. But it means that like someone imported this, and then they probably went to like a street fair vendor to like figure out like what combination of booths and public uh, performances and so on they should have. And once you start doing that, you the range of like excellence or mediocrity it becomes a lot wider. And it just means that it's all the same stuff. Like, whether you go to the the festival here or someplace else, it doesn't feel necessarily that distinct to me. It's all, oftentimes when I go to these festivals or street fairs, I just feel like it's the same stuff, you know, different day. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. So that was something that I, I saw that you, on your list of things that you find a little bit overrated about D.C., It seemed like markets, festivals, things that involve lots of booths popping up on the street. Maybe that's a a category of thing that you might find a little bit overrated in D.C. And in the abstract, I am for them. But 
like if so if you see like a holiday market there's one you know downtown it looks really beautiful from a distance and you see there's people selling like roast peanuts or whatever it smells nice but the actual stuff for sale in the booths mm. You know, like it's not on my Christmas list. I'm glad that these exist and I'm glad there's, I'm always glad for like more reasons to like walk around and find curious things on the streets of a, a city. But uh, if you sort of strip away the nostalgia and the the desire just to be for in, in a vibrant place for its own sake, the actual stuff is usually not that compelling to me. Well, on what about that, you? I feel the same way. Listen, I... Pretty much never when I go to a street festival. <laughs> if you've ever, I always do, so I get disappointed. Because <laughs> I know it's going to be disappointing. But somebody on Reddit made a good point that they think that post COVID, exactly what you said, that people are just they just want an experience of like I just want to go go someplace where it's pretty easy. I'm walking around. I feel like I'm part of like a vibrant outdoor happening, and that that's one of the reasons why. Maybe they've gotten a little meh lately. That's why they're so crowded. That's why it seems like everything's really expensive because people are just craving this kind of experience, whether or not it is actually like a fulfilling good experience for them. What about you? Do you have a quirky Bridget belief in something that's overrated? Something that's overrated. I would probably say the dynamic, and we've we've talked about this on the show before, Mike, but like the dynamic that sometimes is present in DC where your job is a really big part of your life. Now, you and I both, I think we agreed that like people come to DC because they're passionate about things and yeah. like passion is good. And I completely agree with that. But I just think, you know, I, I was thinking about this earlier. In all the cities that I've lived in, I do think that people are prone to make their career kind of the tent pole of their life. Yeah. And that if, there, if something happens in their career, then it's like, who am I? What is my identity? Yes, 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 I yes, was yes. A, my, my whole life was wrapped up in being a congressional staffer, and now I'm not anymore. I think that that is such an overrated way to live your life. And so even though I love D.C. as a city of passionate people who are passionate about what they do, I do think it being a place where it's easy to make your career like central to your life and identity, a little overrated. I, but I mean, let me push back on one part of that, which is Please. that there is also like a truism that, you know, one of the worst things about Washington is that people here always ask, what do you do? And that's so terrible. I actually think like, because of what you said, because a lot of people, for better or worse, they move here for work or work is hugely important to them. I mean, there's a lot of people who live here who weren't born here and they're, they didn't come for the weather, you know? So... What they do for a living is really important to them, which means like asking about it is like actually, you know, it's it. one of my friends put it this way, that it, it's a way of asking, how'd you get here? Mm -hmm. And that is like most people, that's their life journey and they're going to tell you about it. Now, obviously, there's a gap between asking what do you do and then the moment of like silent judgment about whether this person is important enough to keep talking to, <laughs> which is, you know, a very bad thing. Don't do that, people. Let me tell but you, like, as a actually, podcaster, like <laughs> I'm never important enough to keep talking to. <laughs> uh, well, for me, you are. Thank uh, you. Um, but like, I think that the, the condemnation of asking that question is is a little bit overdone. I, I think I think uh, it, it is an underrated question to ask. Oh, so that's on your underrated list. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I, I always thought that that kind of gets a bad rap. And I, I really like what your friend said that like it's a, it's asking about how you got here. Like, why are you in D.C.? You know, I, I really like that. I think that's true. You think that pocket parks are underrated? I do. Uh, I think that. And shout out to our executive producer, Priyanka, who also thinks that. I have a pocket park right across the street. And I don't know. It's just you don't. It's easy to take for granted how much green spaces, even if they are small, really change the dynamic of a block. The only place I would dissent from that is I don't know that these are underrated. I think that that anybody who lives like, you know, I live in Northwest and there's like a lot of triangle parks like in the backyard mm -hmm. where like, you know, where there's like a avenue that, that bisects the grid. And some, some places it means that the area behind houses, there is a weird triangle of, of alleys. And anyone who's got one of those is like ferociously devoted to it and can't talk enough about its joys. And I, I think when you are in the downtown parts of, or part of the parts of the city with more of a clear grid, you every now and then will stumble upon these like street facing pocket parks and they're lovely. 
but I don't know anyone who doesn't like them. So I, I think by calling them underrated, you're pushing back on a negative perception that doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. So I actually, I think that if you have a pocket park or a triangle park or like a tiny piece of Greek base near you, you love it. It makes it, it brightens your day. I think there are plenty of people who have like never thought about it like that. And they're like, oh, this park's so tiny. Like, what difference does it make? And so, yeah, you're probably right that for people who have them in their lives, they are singing their praises all the time. But I do think there are people who've maybe never thought about it because maybe they don't have them in their life or they they live near Rock Creek Park. And so like this tiny little triangle of green space is, you know, who cares about that? Here's one thing I think is underrated or, or people take incorrect pleasure in uh, beating up on is old school, like expense account steakhouses. You know, people will say like, oh, it used to be that the local food scene was nothing but these expense account steakhouses for, you know, lobbyists and stuff. And now we've got all this creative eating. Totally true. But don't sleep on those expensive account steakhouses. If you go to one, they kiss your butt. Oh my God, and yes. you don't feel like a dummy if, if you don't know something on the menu and there's not a like a, oh, I better defer to the chef because like he's like a great artiste uh, kind of vibe. And sometimes that's a nice feeling, especially if you're dropping that kind of money. Do you have one that you like or recommend? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is that like sometimes you go to like a place that, like Morton's in, in on Connecticut downtown. It is, you know, part of a chain. It is, you know, it's everything that like a like indie loving foodie is supposed to disdain. Um, but I actually always kind of enjoy the experience if I go there. I mean, particularly if, if it literally is an expense account meal. Because yeah. <laughs> I don't like to pay. Yeah. And I, I guess it's just like. So often the experience of dining out in D.C. can be frustrating. And it's like, well, it was expensive and frustrating. At least at these places, it's expensive, but probably won't be frustrating. I think the old school thing about it's not the food or, or, or even the, the waiters in those white jackets. It's that the old bargain was like, OK, I'm going to pay a large chunk of my paycheck and you are going to make you know, create the illusion that I am like a king for the next <laughs> two hours. And I remember like when I was a kid. My mom at once put one point said to me, like, have you ever seen a no smoking sign in a jewelry store? Which it's not like I hung out in a lot of jewelry stores. But it, but the point she was making was like, when you're going to drop that kind of money, they're going to let you do whatever you want. And there is a, a nice thing about that feeling. Um, and that was the old bargain of food. Now it's I'm going to pay a lot of money and I'm going to get to feel like I had like an incredible pushing the envelope, cutting edge cultural experience, which is a nice feeling, too. But sometimes you're tired and you just want someone to be nice to you. Yeah, go to Morton's Steakhouse. I swear Morton's <laughs> is not paying us to say these things. Although Morton's, call us. <laughs> Another thing I find kind of underrated about D.C., and this might be kind of a weird one, is that D.C. as a place that is close to other places or easy to get to other places from. Now, I know that kind of sounds like, oh, the best thing about D.C. is that you can leave really easily. But think about it. In D.C., I can take a, you know, 45-minute cab to Dulles Airport and get anywhere in the world. I can take a metro to DCA and get pretty much anywhere. I can get in my car and drive to West Virginia if I want to see, like, sweeping mountains and nature. I do think that it's really easy to be like, oh, well, DC, if you want nature and outdoor adventure, like, you're not going to get it. If you're willing to drive 90 minutes, I think that you can't. I have gotten it. And so I think DC is a city that is close to other cool places. You can get to stuff easily. You know, I have friends that live in places like Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm like, oh, well, how do you get wherever? And they're like, oh, it's always a always a transfer, never a direct flight. DC's not like that. Yeah, it's just an easy hour to Milwaukee. <laughs> yeah. Easy bus to Chicago. <laughs> but look, I guess I, I think because we're the capital of the country, uh, we punch above our weight in uh, airport direct flights, which is terrific. It's a great aspect of, of living here. The place I would disagree about proximity to things is like, uh, you know, weekend away at kind of activities. Even in, in New York, which we think of as like big and therefore must be harder to get in and out, you're like an hour, hour and a half from a lot of beaches, from some mountains, from lakes, from, you know, it's, and same in, when I lived in Philly. But in D.C., like the beach is three and a half hours away. That, and uh, particularly on a Friday afternoon, that drive to West Virginia mountains, that's kind of a, I mean, it's not, you obviously can do it. But it makes it like a, it's a little bit of a, an effort. And I think there actually are a lot of big cities that have the getaway physically closer. I think, I mean, that's fair. I would say if you're fine with a little bit of extra effort and like at the shortest end of it, 90 minutes of a drive, you can get someplace 
nice. So maybe it's not, so maybe we're not, you know, oh, take a train from New York City to upstate New York for a, a cute weekend away. Maybe that's not what we have, but like, you know, it's an hour and change to Shenandoah, you know? As somebody who enjoys an outdoor adventure and a getaway, living in D.C., I would say has made all of those interests easier for me to partake in, not harder. So you're not going to go join your friend in Madison, Wisconsin? As much as I love Madison, shout out to Madtown, shout out to CityCast Madison, probably not. <laughs> so it sounds like we have some general consensus. Monuments might be accurately rated. Yes. Some of the iconic D.C. restaurants kind of depends on the restaurant. Some are over, some are under, some are adequately rated. Street fairs in D.C., totally overrated. I am fine to go rubber stamp that. Totally overrated. Mm -hmm. And we have different opinions on the merits of uh, asking people what they do for a living. Yes. Good. (laughs) So folks out there listening, I culled all of this information from Reddit and the Internet. So we want to hear your opinions. What about D.C. life do you think is overrated, underrated, accurately rated? Feel free to fight with us, debate us, push back. You do not have to agree with my correct opinions about what things are over or underrated. We want to hear from you. You can send us an email at dc at citycast.fm if you really want to let us know. And we can't wait to hear from you. Well, Mike, thanks for being down to get into all of this with me. Hearing your opinions about things that are over and underrated in D.C. has been a pleasure. My opinions are highly overrated, just for the record. (laughs) (laughs) And perhaps overstated, too. Bridget, it's awesome to see you again. Oh, I love it. That's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, share it with a friend that thinks the monuments are overrated. Leave us a review, rate the show, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then. 